Trust in politics is broken. So can we get UK politics working again? That was the last time we were happy. 2012. I'm Beth Rigby, Sky's political editor. Join me every week with Labour's Jess Phillips and Conservative peer Ruth Davidson for some electoral dysfunction. This idea of nuance has completely left politics. Yeah. Together, we'll focus on the policies that could deliver political satisfaction. Follow electoral dysfunction wherever you get your podcasts. I'm Neil Patterson. Welcome back to The Daily. Now, as we edge ever closer to the election, Sky News is running a series of regular reports called Fault Lines, looking at the big issues dominating people's minds as they choose who gets to run the country. And this week, it's the asylum crisis. No one would deny that the system is broken, yet the media and government focus always seems to be on the small boats, how people are getting here, rather than what happens once they do. And that may very well be by design, as there is a gaping hole in the system where those refused asylum are neither cared for nor forced to leave the UK. Some spend many, many years submitting claim after claim, unable to work, living in often desperate conditions, yet not compelled to quit the country. Our community's correspondent, Becky Johnson, has travelled to Hull to see for herself. She's back and she joins us once again on The Daily. Good to see you. Let, let's start with, with the very basics here. You come to the UK, you apply for asylum, you have it rejected. What happens next? So there's a process. Mm -hmm. With your rejection generally comes a letter uh, which tells you your options, um, one of which is to lodge an appeal. Now, that has to be done within 14 days of the rejection. But if you lodge an appeal, you remain with the status of asylum seeker. Now, mm -hmm. appeals are heard in courts, immigration tribunal courts around the country. So, Which, which is a by, by way of contrast with that, with that initial hearing, is. which is a, with a representative of... The Home Office. Right. So the first decision comes from the Home Office, then the appeal is effectively against the Home Office. Right. Let, let, let's just re rewind to the very beginning of all this, because I, I, have, I have a degree of experience. Back when I was at university doing law, I, I did immigration casework. I went to uh, the Home Office buildings in Liverpool on behalf of a local solicitor, sat with people who were claiming asylum. And, and I'll tell you, those in Initial interviews are really, really testing. They ask a huge amount of factual information about the place that you're from, uh, about the political uh, leaders in the area to make sure that you are who you say you are and, and where you're from. So we have, we have this part of the process. So let's start thinking about after that initial hearing, you get this letter back, you appeal, you lose that appeal, you then presumably what bring in the lawyers at this point. Well, if you lose your appeal, you become a failed asylum seeker. Right. So you're then in the country illegally. Right. So 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 what happens then? And 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 and, and how many people are are we thinking are, are kind of in this? What what, what must be a, a, almost a limbo status when it comes to you know the legality of your position? Actually, nobody knows exactly how many failed asylum seekers there are in the country, and part of that is because they are living. As one charity worker describes me, they are living under the radar. Um, so, sorry, just say that again. We don't know how many failed asylum seekers there are in the country. No, there, there are no figures on that. Now, we can have an estimate. So we've got some figures. The Migration Observatory analysed figures from the Home Office that showed in the decade between 2011 and 2020, there's no record of 61% of the rejected asylum seekers leaving the country. So that's a, that's over 55,000 people. And that's three only... fifths, three fifths of them, having had their asylum claim rejected, remain in the UK. Well, there's no record that they've left. Right. Um, and that's just the main applicant. So actually the figure could be much higher because of course people do, in some cases, bring dependents with them too. So, so we, we don't know how many failed asylum seekers are here in the UK. I mean, aren't, aren't people supposed to be put on a plane immediately that their asylum claim has, has been rejected and the appeals process has been exhausted. And I think most people, if they give it any thought, w would assume that if somebody is rejected, they don't remain in the UK. But mm. we know that that's not the case. Actually, very small numbers of people are deported. Um, I mean, one charity worker said to me, she thinks it's because deportations cost money. Um, she says people are literally left mm. in limbo. She said they're, they're effectively hiding in plain sight. So, for example, you could go into a barber's shop or a right. nail bar and the person there, although they don't have a legal right to work, that they could be a failed asylum seeker who's actually being exploited. 
So, so, so tell us about your, your, your trip to Hull. I mean, one person that really stood out to me from, from your reporting was, was Sakile. And, and her story, I think, as a microcosm of the problems that there are within the asylum system is, is quite a useful one. Sakile's story is absolutely fascinating. Now, she volunteers for a charity called Open Doors that provides support for failed asylum seekers. Um, people can go once a week and get eight basic items from the charity. So we're talking about things like soap, mm. rice, that kind of thing. Um, and when we met her, we assumed she was like the other volunteers. It was only when we got chatting that she said that she had been in the country for 18 years, had five failed attempts at asylum and her most recent application was rejected in January. So she is also a failed asylum seeker. She got on a plane in Zimbabwe. Mm -hmm. She claimed asylum when she arrived at the airport here 18 years ago. That claim was rejected and since then she has been on a merry-go-round really where mm -hmm. she's done appeals, she's put in fresh claims, she's living in a bedsit that's paid for by the charity because she has no legal right to work. Mm -hmm. But in that bedsit, there are photographs of two boys, and they're 10 and 7. And she told me they're her sons. And she left them in Zimbabwe all those years ago with her parents. She said she feared political persecution. Mm -hmm. Her plan was to get to the UK, claim asylum, and then bring them over. Mm -hmm. And she hasn't seen them since. No. I haven't seen anyone. Mentally, really, it disturbed me a lot. I'm not myself. So I've got uh, a very bad moment whereby I just want to say, uh, why am I living? Why don't I just end my life? But there's that thing that everything's going to be okay one day. Do, do we know why? her claims have been rejected. What does she say on that? Well, I mean, she'll have put in claims for lots of different reasons because sure. every new claim has to has to have a, a different reasoning behind it. And, and usually mm. they're rejected because, effectively, the Home Office don't, don't believe the argument that somebody's making. How, how on earth are these people surviving? I mean, Sakila is clearly very lucky in, in the way in which she has access to accommodation to this charity. But with the numbers that you're talking about, I mean or potentially that we're talking about, I mean, there, there must be people, you know, close to destitution, taking up valuable space, let's be honest, in a, in, a, in a dwindling kind of supply of social housing that we have in the country at the moment anyway. Well, failed asylum seekers aren't eligible for social housing. There you housing. go. Um, we met a man called Mustafa in his 50s. He came over on the back of a lorry. Um, he's from Iraq. Uh, he came over eight years ago. Claim was rejected. He showed us the park bench in Hull where he's currently sleeping. I tell you, any, any punch here, here, here. Sometimes I, I sit inside for three, four hours because there is heat here. Do you have a sleeping bag? No. What, just in your coat? I... But he has just made a fresh application to the Home Office, and, and a brand new asylum claim, on the grounds that his health has deteriorated. I mean, of course it has, he's sleeping on a park bench. Because he's put in this fresh claim, he's now hoping he'll get a room in an asylum seeker hotel because he now, once again, has the status of asylum seeker. Well, let, let, let's not speak specifically about Mustafa's situation because, of course, that, that process is ongoing. But, but someone in a parallel situation to him who has had asylum claims rejected, is, is living rough, develops health problems as a result of sleeping rough and could potentially have an asylum claim granted on the basis of the ill health that he has acquired. Now, I'm just going to gently suggest at this point that the reason that his health has suffered is because the asylum system is broken and that he wasn't told, forced to leave the country at an appropriate juncture. And I think you've just hit the absolute nub of the problem. Now, this was a system that was designed to work because decisions should be made within about six months. Yeah, it's supposed to be made very, very promptly. Certainly they were when I was doing the job. And now, you know, it's not unusual for somebody to wait two years for an initial decision from the Home Office. It might take another year, two years for the appeal. There are a few people who could say their circumstances haven't changed in four years. Uh -huh. And if they can su successfully prove that their circumstances have changed, they can put in a fresh claim. So, so they, the whole process goes around in circles. But, but I mean, you know, going back to Sakile's example, 18 years in this country, five 
failed asylum claims. But, but we should probably at this juncture hear, hear the Home Office's explanation as to, to what is going on. So the Home Office have given us a statement. It says, we stand firm on our long-standing policy that those without a right to stay in the UK will be removed. Our Illegal Migration Act makes this possible as people who enter the UK illegally will have their asylum claims and human rights claims declared inadmissible and they will not be able to make a life here. And they go on to say each asylum application is individually assessed, including decisions on removal of individuals where people have previously been refused asylum in the UK. A fresh asylum claim can be made through legal representation. So, okay. so they're accepting what was I mean, I, I suppose we really can't go any further in this podcast without mentioning the name Abdul Azidi, of course, the, 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 the Clapham chemical attacker. Um, but before that horrific crime, he engaged in another horrific crime. You know, he was a sexual offender um, and yet remained in the country. So he was a failed asylum seeker, so somebody who'd exhausted all their options, wasn't removed... He then went on to commit and be sentenced for sex offences, uh, put on the sex offenders register, mm. but then converted to Christianity and put in a fresh asylum claim on the grounds that if he went back to Afghanistan as a Christian, he mm. faced persecution. That was, I mean, the Home Office rejected that. They didn't believe him, but ultimately it was successful on appeal. Um, and he is an example of somebody who, if initial... Reje initial rejections, if he'd have been removed after his very first claim was rejected, he wouldn't have even been here to have the time to convert to Christianity or indeed commit those serious sexual offences. You, you found someone else, though, who was a, a, a sex offender who was who'd fallen through the cracks in the system. What did you discover on that? Yeah, and, and in a way, this case that we, we've come across, mm -hmm. the, the court documents from actually a second tier tribunal, so an appeal of an appeal where, where this man was successful, is almost more extraordinary than the Azidi case because this man was granted asylum effectively because of his sex offending behaviour. Sorry? Yeah, it was argued that he has mental health issues, which, which everybody accepts, okay. but that his um, mental illness manifests itself in him... Um, engaging in sexually disinhibited behaviour, effectively. Um, and it was argued that were he to be returned to Afghanistan, his mental health would deteriorate, mm -hmm. which would make that kind of offending more likely. Were he to do that in Afghanistan, he'd be at risk of mob violence. So what is the overriding problem with the removals process then, do you think? <laughs> that is, <laughs> that's a very big question. Mm -hmm. It's costly. Mm -hmm. it, um, there are a lot of cases where lawyers will argue for a long time in courts mm. against the deportation of an individual. Um, and most people who are deported from the UK are foreign national offenders. Mm -hmm. So unless somebody has um, a conviction, which of course Azidi didn't have mm. when he was first rejected because he hadn't committed a sex offence at that point, the chances of being deported are really very low. Does, does all of this not, not make Rishi Sunak's Rwanda scheme look just a little bit more sensible then? Well, that's what the government is seeking to argue. Mm. That's what they're saying, that this will take away that element of hope that people will have, that they can come to the UK and somehow, by some means, whether it's the first attempt, second attempt, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, end up staying here. What The Rwanda scheme, if it gets passed, will mean that people are not able to make a life in the UK. Um, the only thing about it is, you know, I mentioned those... 55,000 failed asylum seekers between 2011 and 2020, mm -hmm. no record of them going home, they're, they're not at risk of being put on a plane to Rwanda. That's also an awful lot of flights as well. It is, it? and it's, it's going to be incredibly expensive. Yeah. I mean, the argument could be made that it would be less expensive to just make decisions here more quickly and then enforce them. Becky, thank you. After the break, I'll be asking one immigration lawyer if his profession might be contributing to the problem. Back in a moment. Two things are certain when it comes to asylum. One, that the system is broken. And two, that the tone of the debate around the issue isn't exactly collegiate. From describing those seeking asylum in terms of swarms of invaders, to branding the assembled ranks of both the legal profession and the judiciary as lefty lawyers, sometimes it feels like a little of the heat could be taken out of the conversation. 
none of which is to suggest that lawyers don't have questions to answer, which is why it's rather handy that we've actually got one on the podcast. Harjap Singh Bangal is a lawyer specialising in immigration. Harjap, great to have you on the on the Sky News Daily podcast. Look, let, we've just been speaking to, to our correspondent, Becky Johnson, and it does appear that there are there are big problems with the asylum system at the moment. Why is it so difficult to remove a failed asylum seeker from this country? Well, previously, under previous governments, it hasn't been that difficult. But under this government, the removal figures are startlingly have gone down. The graphs and all the charts show that the trend from 2010 onwards is there is a lack of removals here, especially when it comes to enforced removals. One of the things that didn't help was when we exited the EU and uh, with our Brexit agreement, we failed to sign any return agreements with any countries. Even at the moment, we only have about seven to eight return agreements with countries. To return people, you need an agreement. So the country where you're returning to has to agree to take them. And in fact, every single one of the EU countries has refused to sign an agreement with us. And we currently don't have, um, like we did under the Dublin Convention, any sort of right to return people to France or from the country where they last became asylum because we opted out of that. But even before, if we look at the figures before 2016, the figures were really low in comparison to 2010. So the problem's been there for a while. And that's the problem with this government, the lack of staff, not enough teams to conduct raids, uh, not enough places to detain people. Sure, I, I can understand the systemic problems. A lack of removal agreements, I hear you. The, the, the lack of staffing within the Home Office dealing with these claims, absolutely understand it. But you're not telling me the lawyers don't have something to do with it as well. Well, you'll be amazed to know, and your listeners will be amazed to know, that lawyers have been around since about 1970. And uh, so has so the Human Rights Act. It's been around since 2002. Now, the problem comes when your enforced removals go down from about 11,000, so say in about 2012, to about 2,000 in 2021, 2022. So that is a problem. If those levels had been sustained as they were in 2010, we perhaps wouldn't be having this conversation. The problem is when people get refused, um, then and even their appeals get refused, and then for two or three years, they're just allowed to stay here without even being encountered by immigration. They develop rights, they develop lives, they have kids here, they have partners here. Just on that point, again, if we have a situation, which we do at the moment, where people are not being re removed from the country in a, in a timely fashion, they, they have to apply again for asylum. And as I understand it, you have to have different grounds than, than the first refused appeal. Isn't that potentially where the vexatious applications for asylum perhaps come in. There will always be abuse of the system, and that's always done by a minority. But the fact is, it shouldn't take a year to decide an asylum claim, or two years. An asylum claim by a trained individual who should be working for the Home Office, and they should all be trained, takes about a day to decide. Can somebody please explain why there are over 100,000 claims who haven't even had an initial decision, and they've been waiting more than a year? Now that is a failing of the home office. That's not the fault of the migrant. They you know the migrant has given the interviews, complied with everything, and the asylum seeker, then half of the decisions, when it goes to appeal, are found to be wrong. So you, you, judges are very highly read, very highly knowledgeable in the law. They look at the decision and they say, hold on, this is totally wrong. The law's been misapplied or not even applied at all. And therefore, this asylum seeker is right. That, you know, the decision is flawed and the home office either has to make another decision which starts a process all over again. Hence, you get multiple claims and lengthy amount of time. And another sort of framing in the system, at the hearings, and I know because I go to a few, and a lot of barristers will confirm this, and a lot of judges will confirm this, a lot of the time, the Home Office doesn't even send a lawyer to defend its decision. So the judge just continues the case without any Home Office representatives there. And therefore, all that day's cases, whether there's five cases in front of the judge, proceed without any Home Office representative. But but but, but do you also accept, uh, Harjap, that, that whilst some decisions may be made absolutely in accordance with the law, when it comes to the court of public opinion, they, they do sit uneasily with, with a lot of people who are not blessed with having the legal experience that, that, that you have. I and mean, we've mentioned Abdul Azidi already, that, that, that someone who was a convicted sex offender could remain in this country in the way in which he did really is uncomfortable for a lot of people to deal with. Yeah, I'm sure it is. But then who's to blame for that once again? The system 
that creates all of these delays, unnecessary delays. We used to have a fast track system um, where claims were decided in 15 days when people were detained at detention center near Heathrow called Harmonsworth. I know I was on the fast track scheme. And then they even had a call at the detention center. So a judge used to sit at the detention center. So if anybody appealed, say on Friday, the hearing would be on the Monday and the whole case would be done and dusted in 20 days. Now a 20 day process has now been extended to two years. We, we clearly have a, have a broken system. We have asylum seekers, failed asylum seekers, lodging claim after claim, often bouncing from, from lawyer to lawyer. I mean, the money that is paying for this process is, is coming out of the pockets of, of taxpayers, presumably via legal aid. And, and again, to some outside the, 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 the world in which you work and the world in which I work, frankly, look at it and see that the only people who are benefiting from this are, are lawyers. Well, actually, legal aid has been cut drastically. So when an asylum seeker claims asylum, a lawyer isn't involved. A lawyer actually only gets involved at the appeal stage. And as for lawyers getting legal aid, you'll find a lot of people don't work on legal aid because legal aid is just so poorly paid. It only pays you tops about 60, 70 pound an hour when privately you could be getting 250 pound for, for, the, for the same sort of work that, that you're doing if you did it on a private basis. And have a lot of asylum seekers actually pay for their uh, lawyer services by actually taking money off friends and family. That's what established communities do. They gang up and they, 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 they help each other out and, and pay them money. Hard tap. Thank you. Well, let's wrap this up with our correspondent, Becky Johnson, once again. Look, look Becky, the whole, the whole point of this, the, this fault line series is, you know, identifying big issues for the election, going into some of the depth. I mean, do, do you, first and foremost, do you think that this is, you know, as, as live a political issue as certain newspapers, certain television channels seem to think? I think it is. Mm. And I think it's an issue for people, whichever side of, of the political debate they sit on, actually. I think... There is no doubt that there are some people who are very angry, for example, that asylum seekers um, are put up in hotels whilst mm. waiting for decisions to be made. Um, but when, you know, there are, are people who are very angry on behalf of failed asylum seekers who are living lives of utter destitution mm. because they're not removed or helped. It's so, the system isn't working for anyone. Well, what, what, what they don't hear from the government is an acceptance of the fact, and correct me if I'm wrong here, that since 2010, which is, of course, when the Conservatives first came into power, obviously in the coalition at the time, but since 2010, the asylum system has gotten worse. It's just only gone in one direction. Certainly, I mean, decision-making has become extremely slow. Mm. Delays in the system are a huge part of why the system isn't working for mm. anyone at the moment. You've been speaking to one Home Office Minister. I mean, what, what have they been saying? Well, the points that we've raised in our reporting were put to Laura Farris, Home mm -hmm. Office Minister. And she said, we want to end this merry-go-round of people coming in. She used the word merry-go-round. Really? Which... You know, this is a party that has been in power now for over a decade. Yeah, they've been manning. They've been manning the ticket office they've at the Medigrand the for 14 years. Yeah, and the system ultimately is designed by the lawmakers, by the government. And and for a, for a government minister to describe the asylum system as a merry-go-round is really quite something. Do, do we know what Labour will do? So we've heard from Yvette Cooper, Shadow Home Secretary. Now, she has described the system as being hugely chaotic. She says that um, Labour is, has got a proposal for a stronger return and enforcement unit. So she's pointing out, she says that under the Tories, the number of people returned has, has fallen. So they would like to see a more, more robust enforcement when somebody is rejected by the asylum system. And maybe, I don't know, something of a national conversation at some point about exactly what we want uh, from our asylum system. Uh, Becky? Always good to see you. Thanks very much for being with us. We, of course, asked the Home Office for a response to Harjap's claim that the department was often unrepresented in asylum's appeals in court. They sent the following statement. In the vast majority of cases where there is a right of appeal, the Home Office is represented by individuals who are specially trained in immigration law and practice to ensure decisions are robustly defended at appeal where it is right to do so. 
or that was the statement, indeed data we were directed to by the Home Office, shows that in 90% of appeals in 2022-23, the Home Office was represented, which of course means that one time in ten, they were not. That's a lot for today. We'll see you again soon.